said, pay me $2 a month, send the rest of it to my mama. So and you took two dollars and the rest went home. to my mama, okay. and uh, we lived in a little holler back in the country, and and that money they put a water line from the Seal Mountain Road into that place where they lived. So they didn't have to use the well. It was about a mile. Well, it wasn't a mile. It's good. How far was it, Steve? It was more than half a mile. Yeah, right. And he yeah. took a mule and a plow and. and Plowed up and got the pipe and put it together to sell. Put water in the house. First time we'd had water in the house in my lifetime, you know. The house I was born in burned down when I was 10 years old. And, and you, you talk about something traumatic. When, when you look and ain't nothing but a smoke and ashes, you know. Uh, and you don't, the only thing you have is what you got on, you know. So, so tell me, what's your what's your full name? Uh, Billy Bernard Lines, B-E-R-N-A-R-D, Bernard Lines. Okay, and your what's your birth date? October 27th, 1922. Uh, five minutes after seven on a Friday morning. Well, that's first off. Today's first off. And the uh, doctor that aided my mother drove a horse and buggy from where he lived over yonder three or four miles to my house to help her deliver me. Where were you born? I mean, what, I was born, area here? I, well, I was born at the junction of Dayton Boulevard and Signal Mountain Road. I was born off of Signal Mountain Road. Is that close to here? Uh, Chattanooga. Chattanooga. It's 12 miles from Chattanooga, north on the highway. 27. 27. It's been annexed as part of Chattanooga. Used Red Bank for a while. No, it was called Valdo. B-A-L-D-E-A-U. Yeah, it's, it's Valdo still on the map. Yeah. Is it? I, yeah, know, the, I know White Oak is. It, White Oak's just it, it was Valdo. just a settlement, and we had a film station, mm -hmm. and we had a grocery store. My grandpa run the grocery store when I was real little. He lived, my mama uh, lived about a fourth of the way up the W Road on Signal Mountain. And uh, when she was 12 years old, they moved to Valdo, and, and he leased a store, a gro country grocery store. Had crackers in a wooden box. He basically had pickles in a barrel, you know. And uh, had a glass case, and on top of that glass case was the best thing in the world, the candy. <laughs> it's all hard candy, you know, yeah. peppermint sticks and stuff. But it was great. <laughs> Sounds like where my mom grew up. Um, so tell me about your your early years. You were telling me about going to school, little schoolhouse, and it didn't have running water at first. Can you tell me that story again? Yeah. Well, uh, maybe this ought to be off record. My sister accidentally dropped me off an eight foot porch and, and hit my head. And my mama thought that I might have uh, damage, you know. Yeah. And uh, so she catered to me. She didn't send me to school when I was six, like everybody else. Uh, I, I, was, I was eight, I guess. I didn't get out of high school until I was 20 years old, you know. But I went regular. And uh, first grade, they, they kept me twice. But other than that, I made it all right. Uh, I graduated from uh, Chattanooga Vocational High School. I went there all four years when I was in high school. And... Uh, the War Department had started, and uh, they was teaching a, a class to daddy fathers out in the community uh, that was too old to be drafted. They thought they'd have a backup bunch of machinists, so they came to my vocational school. I kept the two rooms, four, uh, three to eleven, caught the last bus out of Chattanooga 
to Valdo, where I live, walked home from, from a bus line. How far was that? Uh, uh, it was, uh, I, I walked from Dayton Boulevard, that's 27, uh, down Signal Mountain Road to where we live. We lived off Signal Mountain Road. Okay. We had 35 acres there. And, um, So tell me about your service and like when you enlisted and where'd you go for training? Um, well, just kind of walk me through the Okay. Well, there. me and my best little buddy, we've been buddies, I don't know, from eighth grade to twelve, you know. And uh, he he was a joy. Uh, him and his family were Christians, you know. And uh, uh, he he was real people. I loved him. Who and was uh, what was his name? Malcolm Floyd. He's dead now, but uh, he and I joined together, and uh, we we took all the physicals and all the aptitude tests and everything in the second floor of the United States Post Office. It was a federal building in Chattanooga. And we took the physicals and and every other test that they had to make sure you was material, you know, for the Air Corps. It was Army Air Corps. Uh, when, when we heard that, well, we both answered an airplane. Like I said, we've been to level field when it wasn't nothing but a cow pastor, you know. And... Uh, uh, they just had old, you know, cubs and stuff like that back then, you know, only thing out there. But anyway, we wanted to learn to fly airplanes, so we volunteered when we was about halfway through high school. We learned that and volunteered, went down and signed up, and we took all the physicals, aptitude tests, and everything else and on the second floor of the post of a federal building in Chattanooga. And uh, so we s signed up and everything, you know, and they said, y'all go ahead and go to school. It was about halfway through high school when we did this. Said, y'all go ahead and finish school and we'll call you after you get out of school. Well, I know it was two or three months after we graduated. We both graduated from Kirk, uh, Kirkman Chattanooga Vocational High School, and we both took machine shop, and we were qualified. Then as we went four years, the uh, union, labor union, you know, uh, said that we were journeymen because we spent four years, and we had, we went through everything, lathes, milling machines, uh, shapers, every kind of, you know, welding, uh, that you can imagine about being a machinist. And uh, anyway, when we graduated, we still hadn't heard from the military. I got a job in a machine shop. And I worked there till they called me, you know. And they gave us both a t ticket the same. We was on the same shipping or orders, you know, or notice the report orders and we caught the uh, uh, Dixie Flagler train in Chattanooga about 10 o'clock one night and we clicked along the next morning was in Miami Beach, Florida along with 8 million troops uh, taking calisthenics and basic you know orientation all that stuff it's hot down there and we, we had physicals all morning and, you know, like running 10 miles for breakfast, you know. They thought that was a trick, you know. Lord. And a lot of them little high school boys, they fell out, you know, in Florida. But me and my little buddy, we'd run every step of it. And uh, we, 
I remember, I can't remember the, the military had confiscated all of the motel, hotels and there wasn't anybody there but people that lived in Florida, you know, Miami. Mm -hmm. And we had the whole beach to ourselves. And we, every morning we'd take calisthenics on the beach itself. You could throw rock in the water, you know, ocean. And they had eight foot square platform, about 10 feet tall. And I climbed up on one of them one morning and looked. I couldn't see the end of it that way. And I couldn't see the end of it that way. I mean, you can't imagine. Well, eight million troops in Florida. But uh, anyway, we went through our 11 weeks of basic, and uh, they sent me to Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville Army Air Force Base was about halfway between Greenville and the ocean. Greenville Army Air Force Base. And that's where we I took my training about pilot, you know, pilot training. And in the university I took meteorology and navigation. You know, both of them essential to pilots, you know. I mean, they had a good system. And uh, I don't remember how long we was there, but after, after we left there, uh, they sent me to Biloxi, Mississippi, to airplane mechanic school. Then they sent me to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, General Motors had a building on Michigan Avenue. Pratt & Whitney sent five. There was, uh, was about 10 of us, maybe 15. They sent us five brand new, never had been cranked, 18 cylinder double road radial engines, 1200 horsepower engine, you know. We took them Hummers, separated every piece on it that had come apart, put it in a degreaser, degreased it, come over there and reassembled the Hummer, and then they sent us to a Ford place in Ypsilanti, Michigan. It was a test sale. We bolted the Hummer up in a test sale put a wooden club pop on a short prop, cranked her up, and tested it. And that was my, and of course I, I went to, like I say, the boxes, the engine, I mean, uh, airplane mechanics, and we had the engine specialist. We, we was, we was jam up, you know. Uh, they even put, they trigger the, the engines, you know, and try to run them up. Well, they'd miss on one cylinder, miss on one bank, or uh, didn't, wouldn't accelerate good or something. You know, they, they go, boogered them up, you know, and we we think of, what's the matter with that Hummer, you know? Uh, we, we, us boys, we're doing good at analyzing that stuff, you know. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a great time. Uh, and like I say, they sent us to that fourth place in Ypsilanti and we, we cranked them Hummers up and run them. It's cold up there. Yeah. Uh, they put us in a barracks and uh, a little old wood burning stove, but there wasn't no coal for it. And uh, there's a table or two in there. I'm sorry to say, we, we busted that table up and put it in that stove. <laughs> <laughs> when it's cold, you got to <laughs> <Yeah>. improvise. <laughs> You're right. Anyway, uh, after Ypsilanti, uh, uh, airplane mechanics school and all that kind of stuff, they sent me to uh, Berkson Air Force Base in Austin, Texas. And uh, it's, it's not there now. They gave the field to the city of Austin for an airport. I mean, it was it had everything: hospitals, uh, theaters. You see a free, free movie every night, and and the military had movies that the public didn't have. You know, I, I saw a movie five years before they was 
when I got back home, you know, that this is coming out. You know, I'd already seen them. I mean, we had priorities, boy. Uh, military looked after the troops. I can truly say that. And, uh, of course, uh, sometime in all that training, uh, we spent 10 weeks in the boonies of, out in the swamps of, of Louisiana or somewhere, oh uh, camping out in tents. And I know one time I was prowling around and I saw a bunch of mold in the corner, you know, a big block of mold. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what is that? I was prowling around in the, in the spy house, you know. Wasn't nobody there. I took my trusty bayonet, it's in that box, I reckon, and scraped that mold off. And there was a block of cheese. I cut me. I love cheese, you know. Boy, that was the best tasting cheese. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> mold, you scrape the mold off and eat it. Boy, it was good. Of course, you know, we, uh, they had good meals, but. How long were you in Louisiana? We went down there for bivouac and. And, uh, That's okay, you can pause. Well, I, I can't remember what we were, to tell you the truth. It was out in the boonies. I mean, swamps, you know. That's okay, we'll skip over that. Um, we'll just wait until. That's okay. Oh, go on. Didn't he? I can edit that out. <laughs> Easy enough. Pun Puncha. Punch a button, honey. <laughs> Unplug it, Steve. Yeah. Hmm? Ain't nothing worse than a telephone. Well, <laughs> they must be beneficial somewhere. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> I'll cut that part out. But, um, <laughs> um, so you were in Texas and then... Berksham, that was the best Air Force base that ever was. Man, and they gave it, I, t I guess I told you, they gave it to the city of Austin yeah. when the war was over. And, and they made a park out of what was the the fairgrounds, you know, Austin fairgrounds, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they used the Air Force Base for uh, City Park, you know. It was a fine place. They had everything you needed. Didn't you say you went to Mississippi? Biloxi. Air, yeah. Biloxi, did you Yeah, Biloxi. Yeah, I took... Uh, airplane mechanic school and uh, when they moved me to Bergstrom Field, Texas why uh, what, did, what did you train on in, in Texas? I'm sorry? What did you train on in Texas? Uh, we had already been to my airplane mechanic school so they put us in a five man crew to maintain aircraft and we was all mechanics you know they changed they had a, the plane we, was C-47 military, and uh, we wound up with a four-man crew, pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, and what they called a flight engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, and when, when we was, t I was back in Greenville taking, uh, trying to learn to fly an airplane. I've got vertigo. I've had it all my life, you know. My semicirculars don't have the right amount of fluid in them, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did all right till it come to putting a, one of the maneuvers, like a Steve will tell you, put the airplane in a spin, left rudder, right, left rudder, right stick, count five spins, you know. I I get so dizzy I couldn't stand up you know 
And uh, so there was five majors sit around a table, and they told me that, uh, you know, you've got a problem about flying an airplane. I said, I surely have. And they said, well, we've got five. We're going to have to take you out of this flight training program. And we've got five ornaments, and they named them all mechanics and all that. I said, well, let me have our plane mechanics. So that's when I went to Texas, and I, they put me in a crew, and we worked on our plane, changed the spark. They changed the spark plug every 25 hours. You could take one out, and there wasn't a thing the matter with it, you know. We throwed it in a trash can and put another one in there. We did a 18-cylinder engine, double nine radio, 1,200 horsepower, pulled 11 foot, three-bladed aluminum prop, 1,200 horsepower. Of course, after uh, I was assigned to crew, I went, that's my job, four o'clock every morning. I went out there where it was. It might be part of a quarter of a mile out there. The, you know, we had a bunch of them. And I run it up, tested everything on it, you know, full throttle, brakes, uh, of course, oil pressure, first thing you look at, you know, General, uh, alternators, make sure you had a charge, check everything on it, airlines and controls, signed the paper, and it checked it was all right. And if we was going to fly that day, I'd taxi it up to the line. If we wasn't going to fly, I just went back and got breakfast. Did a mess all with all them other troopers. <laughs> Tell them about that right there. That's the diagonals. I carried those diagonals. They're stamped. U.S. Army somewhere. Right there, they're stamped USA. I carried them Hummers in my pocket. You know, we had four fuel tanks and two in each wing. Yeah. And, and down under the bottom of them, up under there, was a little <clears throat> catch basin, a little, it had a little valve in the bottom of it. You open it up and you caught the water that was in the gas tank. See how much condensation you had, you know. And then when you cut it back off, you took a piece of brass safety wire we had a, in our pocket. We had a roll of it. Run that little brass safety wire in there. Tighten it off, cut it off. I carried them all the way through the whole three years in my pocket. And I still got them. They marked United, USA, United States Army. But, uh, yeah, I still got they went with me in my pocket wherever I went, you know. Yeah. I've got a silver dollar my brother gave me. When I was 12 years old, he gave me a 1922 silver dollar for my birthday. I put that Hummer in my pocket. It's not in my pocket right now, but it's in there in the drawer. I put it in my pocket. I carried it with me. Over hill and dale, wherever I went, is in my pocket. So it's been over England, over Germany, over France, you know, flying an airplane. When did you go to uh, England? Is that where you went first, overseas? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. The, and, and how did you get there? Or what uh, route? You won't believe how I got there. I went on a ship that was a sister ship to the Britannica. It was about 700 feet. It was a British ship. And uh, along with about 6,000 other troops. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it was the English for breakfast. You won't believe what I'm going to tell you. They gave us a boiled potato, horse potato, for breakfast. That's all we had till late in the afternoon, and they give us a bowl of soup. Now, I've been on a troop ship from Lahore of England after the war was over. They sent me to 
Natal, Brazil. I went to Port of Spain, Trinidad first. And uh, I, I got off, off, that airplane, off that ship. It was an American troop ship. We had breakfast, rotate, you know, and, and took the dinner to lunch time to get everybody. I don't remember how many was on there. But uh, that we had breakfast, and then they gave us a bowl of soup about 2 o'clock and ate Merkin, you know. We went in a clean place and picked up the soup and went on because there's so many of us on there, you know. But uh, they sent me to Port of Spain, Trinidad, and there's where I got out of the troop care group into ATC. Army Transport Command. And all the time before, Army Transport Command, all they did fly was supply bases. You know, all they went to was another Air Force base mm -hmm. to haul supplies. We called them allergic to combat because that's all they ever did. <laughs> we was over there hauling paratroops. <laughs> they was flying. <laughs> allergic to combat. <laughs> ATC. Well, the sad part of it is, when I got to Trinidad, they dispersed the 14th Squadron, 61st Troop Air Group, and they put me in a, 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 a airport tra uh, ATC, Air Transport Command. So I had to be with them. The uh, object was. After the war, I wound up. I want to tell you a story. When I got to Trinidad, got off that ship, troop ship, fine. I said, I've gone to find me an ice cream. So I, I got off, I'm walking down through there, and, and here come a tall black fella, you know. And uh, I said, uh, uh, have they got ice cream in that PX or store? Perfect English. He said, they surely have, you know. I think they went on and got me ice cream. Because we were chugging along uh, across an ocean in this big old troop ship. And uh, little destroyer escort come along, you know, bouncing in the waves. Little feller, we shot him a string over there and pulled a hole, the line, and then pulled a hose over there and filled up his oil tanks, fuel oil, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we got through, they sent him a 10 gallon, <laughs> 10 gallon bucket of ice cream. <laughs> We didn't, the crew got ice cream. We didn't get any ice cream. <laughs> it, it was a concrete mixer, mix up enough ice cream for everybody, you know. Lord. But I, I thought about that a lot. I'll tell you the incident when we was in England. We took the powdered milk. You know, we didn't, we didn't get fresh milk. You had powdered milk. Stirred it up with water, you know. We, we got 10 gallon in a big container, stirred up reconstituted milk, and we took K rations. There was a, a chocolate based bar that had other stuff in it, you know, for, for stamina and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. vitamins. There's a great big bar, K, K ration. It was essentially chocolate bar with stuff in it, you know. We took a whole bushel basket full of them and sent them with the ice cream, with the milk, and I think it was nearly 40 miles. We hauled it up there in a six by to this place. It was a, uh, they made ice, ice plant, and they froze that for us. We covered it up good and hauled it back. Everybody ate ice cream. <laughs> of course, 
The wheels didn't know nothing about it, you know. <laughs> but we had a buddy that drove the six by, you know. So, well, anyway. <laughs> well, tell me about, you know, when you were in England, and, and where else did you serve? You know, and what what did you do with the uh, troop carrier? Yeah, we had a pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, and and um, flight engineer. Yeah. Flight engineer, they called them. But anyway, uh, we hauled 16 paratroopers, eight on each side. We had, this is a plain black and bare uh, C-47 mm -hmm. military aircraft. It had been a, a they'd used it for passenger plane, then they stayed. You know, it was modified. And boy, it was good. And uh, most of them had double doors, and I had a pair of, of racks, and I'd take them racks out and put them down there as loon them, and uh, a bunch of little fellas get around a Jeep and roll it up in there, about five of them or six, well, seven or eight of them, eight or ten, whatever they could get a hold of, they picked it up and squared it around and pushed it back in the back, and we tied it down. We all threw uh, a jeep and, and pushed that Hummer out with a parachute. You know, of course, they banged up, you know. I know they were. But anyway, and uh, to resupply... Uh, so you'd, you'd carry in uh, all kinds of equipment and vehicles and other gear for the troops? Yeah, we, we hauled, uh, well, most Jeeps had a 40 millimeter howitzer on the back of them, you know, short barrel, uh, that, that they towed it. And we got that thing in there, because well, we had plenty of help, you know. <laughs> <laughs> them, them boys, uh, 81st Airborne and 102nd, I felt for them. There I was uh, flying along, you know, and we we dropped them. What it mounted to, we dropped them in the pit of hell, you know, behind enemy line. When Patton got to the the three generals going south of the border up Germany, Clark and the other one got to. Rhine River, there was a bridge, you know, they was on a highway. Old Patton over here, he got to the river. You know, there's three of them. When he got to the river, there wasn't no bridge. So he had to stand, stand down until call them. They had this best system, platoon barges, you know, big old barges, mm -hmm. great big barge, and they'd hook together. They push one in the river, hook another into it, and push him in. Yeah. Hook another into it. They had a bridge, a floating bridge, and that's how Patton got his tanks and his troops across the river. Well, there's enemies over there across the river, so we dropped them paratroopers in amongst them, you know, in a pit of hell itself. I don't know. War is hell any way you figure it, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's stupid. But anyway, uh, I'll tell you a story. We went to uh, a temporary Air Force base in South Carolina, I can't think of the name of it. It's, it wasn't there before. The military took it and cleaned it up and, and amongst the pine trees. We went there for maneuvers. We had, I think it was about 2,500 troops. We had a blue, green army and a red army. 
and uh, we encamped during them pine trees, and we had our strip, and they'd fly over a little old cub and drop a pound bag of flour, you know, a paper sack full of flour, and throw it out, you know, and it hit the ground and burst. That's where a bomb hit. If you were standing there, you know, you're dead. So you didn't, you wouldn't count it, you know. Well, we was going to have nighttime maneuvers. And uh, me and the co-pilot and the radio operator went down. Of course, in the military, two times a day, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you went down to the orderly room and read that cotton-picking board, you know. I mean, that was a, you, you didn't do, if you didn't eat, you went and read that board. So anyway, they had our pilot with a different crew. And, uh, and we had a substitute pilot in our crew. I said, well, Lord Helmer, let's go down and talk to, to uh, uh, well, the people that made up the flights. Anyway, we told him, said, look here, you, you got our pilot in a different crew. And the old boy looked at him, well, he yeah, asked, I don't know how that come about. He said, uh, we said, well, let's change it because we're going to have like nighttime maneuvers at night. He said, go ahead, let's go ahead, and I'll change it in the morning. And we already got this in the works, you know him flying an airplane with a different crew. Well, come night time and we took off and, and under the airplane with some hooks and I had three lights there and we hooked them bundles up. Of course, I had plenty of help and they were cloth bags, you know, military thick cloth bags and they had hook and we hooked them up on there just like you, you, you hook a bomb in a bomb bay you know hook them up and I had a switch there and three lights and I get the red light to alert me you know I get a green light I punch a button you know and drop him so when the I never have seen I've hauled several paratroopers. I never have seen any that hesitated. The the jump master, when when I got that alert light, I I tell him, you know, he was right there. I tell him, and uh, he he he'd have him stand up and hook up. And when I got that green light, why well, he always put one in front of him, and they in the door. Yeah, he got up to the door. I got the door all the way, opened it, and uh, they stood there. He put one in front of him, and when he got the light, I'd swamp him on the leg, you know. He pushed that guy out in front of him and jumped out after him, and they all went, it went like clockwork. They never, I never seen one of them yesterday. I mean, they just were, you know, jumping off into the pit of hell. Sometime, but anyway, what happened? Our pilot was with a different crew, and they said, "Wait till the morning." Well, we were going to drop. We had power bags on there, you know. We was going to drop him, resupply, and it was flying formation. He was up there ahead of us, and somewhere or another, somebody ahead of him dropped their bags too early and uh, he flew into it plane crashed and burned and we went over there the next morning there wasn't nothing but smoldering aluminum mm. you know and he perished my, my pilot and if we could have got him changed that night you know mm. but you know I don't understand the grace of God but he does but uh, he was a good little old boy. He was a Jew. And uh, uh, we'd be on, say, I ate our flight, 
he bring a sack full of sandwiches. Had to put this little Jewish wife at every word. She just, you know, beautiful little people, you know. And uh, I just loved him because he was, he was jam up. I mean, he was good. I trust him with my life any day. And co-pilot was his daddy run a bank. And anyway, um, he, he was in that plane that run into the bags and crashed. And we went over and I got a Jeep the next morning, took a, and a radio operator went and just smoldering, you know. Well, uh, sometime before, I had went to the supply and got a little compass. It was in a case, you punch a button and the case flew up and there was the compass. Mm -hmm. I got two, I gave one to my buddy pilot, you know. He had in his pocket, and I kept mine in my pocket. I found that compass in that pile of debris as a burning the next smaller, smaller the next one. And it had burnt the case off of it, but it had the little brass innards in the hand, and it still worked. And I've got it somewhere, you know. I picked it up out there because I knew what it was, you know. He had it in his pocket. I never understand why. But anyway, he was a good man. But anyway, um. I went to England and, and uh, from there we hauled paratroopers. We hauled more British paratroopers than we ever hauled in my particular bunch. Hauled more English paratroopers than we ever hauled Americans. We have all the 81st and 101st Airborne, you know, but... Yeah. 82nd and 101st. I'm sorry. 82nd Airborne and 101st Airborne. Right. And they're still in business Did, today. Did, were you involved with uh, Operation Market Garden? Or... Uh, drops? That was uh, in Holland. Yeah. Uh, flew over Holland. Uh, I don't. I don't remember going to that one. I don't. I, okay. I would say. Um, I, I would say I didn't. But I remember it. I mean, you know, because we, we had, we had, each squadron had twenty-one airplanes. Yeah. And we busted a gut to make sure we could have the Heidi Woods to have twenty of them. Fiber every day, so that kept us busy. <laughs> kept us busy. I've changed enough spark plugs that a one-ton truck wouldn't haul them. Every twenty-five hours, and and they do double nine, eighteen cylinders. You know, double nines. Change spark plug. You could take one out and look at it. Look brand new. We put it in a trash can. Ain't no time what they cost. They probably cost twenty dollars a piece for the military, cause it was shielded. Tell him about France, cause I've never heard about. Fr I, I've heard France mentioned, but I've never heard any of the incidences of France. France. And my other question is, since he's got you captured right now, <laughs> I'm learning a lot more than I've ever heard it once. Well, this is wonderful. And uh, thank you. The paratroopers were they? The only place you took paratroopers was to Germany to drop off. No, we we we, we hauled them to Holland. And, Probably just France, Holland, and yeah, and we and they involved? and then they moved us to France. You know, well they moved us to France because uh, we went to that little old beat up Air Force, but uh, our Base is your camera, is your in Abbeville, near Abbeville, and uh, uh, we we went there to haul British paratroopers again. Just south of the border, German border, and we went in March before the June invasion, 
and all British paratroopers, and and they formed a line that right below in France, right below the German border, in case the Germans come from Germany and interfered with the invasion, the Normandy invasion, you know. So we we went on war specifically to Abbeville, hauled in British par we hauled British paratroopers, bless their precious. And and the, of course they for right below Abbeville it wasn't far from the German border, so to keep them from Germans from interfering with the invasion in Normandy. Anyway, Lord. So uh, and I think after, am I understanding this right? After the war, you. Uh, Transported troops returning to the U.S. Yeah, uh, that's when I got out. Of, they disposed of the fourth, well, sixty-first troop carrier group. Is that what you were telling me earlier? Yeah. Okay. And uh, our mission was to. They had fifty thousand troops in North Africa, I think, and they was going to get them back to the states. And we, uh, they sent uh, C fifty fours and their four engine aircraft. To haul them back. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I ain't no hero. I just we, we I was blessed with having a a good crew and good troops and uh, we. I never did run across but one man in the whole shooting match. And he was with us overseas and in this country, and he was alcoholic. And they didn't know what to do with him. He never flew a, in a, he never was a crew. He, he wandered around and picked up trash or whatever they had, you know, but he was alcoholic. I don't know. I know when we was in France, he, he wanted me to go to, Abbeville with him one night, and he had got in with a family, and even though there was a war, this man and his wife, I, I remember the house because it had one of those uh, white glass, she had the white glass uh, little figurine, you know. Yeah. My mama had one on her mantel, and this lady, French lady, had one on her mantel, and I told her, you know, and uh, they had uh, they had uh, basement full of wine, and he went to he got in with those people and drank their wine. Of course, I I didn't want no wine, you know. I, I never. Uh, when I was in high school, me and my two buddies, the same one that went with me to Florida, we pulled in a honky tonk and. And uh, I, I don't know when I was in high school, 1940 something, too. Um, we pulled in the honky tonk, and a woman come out and we ordered a beer a piece. We thought everybody drinks beer, let's us try it, you know. Well, I took one syrup, I spit it out. I, I never have. I poured mine out, you know. Well, Malcolm tasted his, and he said, Good Lord, the people drink it. He poured his out, too, so we... <laughs> that ended our beer drinking spree, you know. I understand. I always felt the same way. <laughs> <laughs> and neither one of us ever drank any alcohol that I know of. I mean, we might have drank it in medicine or something, but we didn't drink it out of a bottle. So after the war, I'll go over this briefly. What what did you do when you came home? Well, you know, one time I was a general. Uh, I can't think of which one it was. And a, a man like you, a photographer, newsman, asked him, said, General, what are you going to do when the war is over? He said, I'm going to sit in my front porch in my rocking chair. And the man said, what are you going to do then, General? He said, I'm going to start rocking slowly, you know. 
And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to sit on my grandpa's front porch and look at that 35 acres, you know, and relax. Well, I had an uncle. My, my, my granny had three daughters, and one of my aunts married a fellow that he was a personnel of Brock Candy Company. It, it's not, they sold out, you know, but anyway. It had been since 1906. Uh, Bach had been a senator, the old man had been a senator at one time, but for a while. But anyway, um, he called me and he said, uh, we, we need to get up to going, you know. We, they cut back, you know, on kind of sugar and all. Uh, yeah. A candy company runs on sugar. They get. Uh, they get it in a box car full of hundred pound bags, you know, hundred thousand pounds at a time in a box car. Get a box car. They get three of them, you know, and had blankets to uh, workers to unload it. Well, um, he, he called me and he said, "Cause he, he, I, I just tended to be a. He knew I'd been to." tech school, you know, machinist, and I had wired some outlets for him at one time, and he knew I was, so he called me and he said, uh, we, we're trying to get full blast, you know, come and help us. I said, Uncle Milton, I, I, I don't, you know, I want to rest. And uh, <laughs> he bugged me and bugged me, and bugged. he called me three times a day. We need you down there to help us get full blast again. We got to get up and going, you know. We've been shut down to the bare minimum. And uh, we didn't make nothing but hard candy. And uh, anyway, they made Brock bars, 42 inch belt, and it was laying full. And it rolled off for 24 hours a day. A Brock bar was like a Babe Ruth. It was a, a a center wrapped in chocolate and then dipped in peanuts, you know. Mm -hmm. We roasted our own peanuts, 100, 100 pound sack at a time. And when they come out of there, we had another little chute over here. We could run them through and grind them up and make peanut butter. And you could dip your finger in that where the peanut butter come out. It was warm, you know, and fresh. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> But anyway, I finally went to help him, you know, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, she worked in a little different building from me, and of course they sent me over. She caught off of a conveyor belt. She caught a weighing, and they put a plastic bag up there, weighed so many ounces, you know, put a label on it, and they put them up in a machine that had heated and they pushed it with their leather with their foot and, and clamped the label to it, you know, sealed it. Yeah. And we made, in the shop, we made those sealers, you know. And, of course, they was fraught with danger. I mean, they uh, working, you, you couldn't keep them little heater elements, you know. So we went over a lot of time. Well, I went over one day and he sent me by himself. And there was three good-looking young women. Well, I looked at her, you know, and she smiled. And I told her, I said, your smile lights up my life. That's the first time I, thing I ever told my wife long before we was married, you know. But she, she was a joy. She was the best helpmate God ever gave a man. I can truly say that. When did you get married? 1940. Uh, 1950, yeah. 51? 1950, uh, July? July the 4th, 1950. July the 1st? Yeah, we wanted to go to Myr Myrtle Beach or somewhere. And uh, we thought we'd better get married. You know, <laughs> we, we got a... Uh, Senior judge in Chattanooga 
Hamilton County judge, the mayor, because he, he said he'd do it on Saturday, you know. I didn't know what to give him, you know. I think I gave him a $10 bill. I didn't know what it cost. <laughs> <laughs> you probably gave him too much. <laughs> well, he's, he's probably done it for nothing. He's a good old man. And uh, so how many years were you married? 67. Best helpmate God ever give a man. 67 years. Well, what do they say? Married bliss. <laughs> yeah. She had her own job. She still worked for that candy company. And then when we both left there, uh, she worked for an insurance company for a while. And then she went to Social Security. She worked for Social Security 30 years and never did sign up. When she retired, she didn't have any Social Security. They so that, the they let her work three months so they could give her an end, you know. She made a few dollars, but she always had her own money. They never was questioned the money. she buy the groceries. I, I bought the cars and paid the utilities and all that kind of stuff. i buy a new car, give it to her, and i take the old one. I got her one she drove out there right now. Yeah. To check in. She did that during the Vietnam era. But uh, Steve and I both had a good job. He co oped when he was in high school, but I, I went with him. I worked for combustion engineering, you know, uh, in the engineering department. And my mother in law worked in there too with me. Uh, she, she checked a lot of my drawings. I made Drawing the border parts and one thing or another, you know. And then I went with TV, and that was the best move I ever made. I mean, that, yeah, that was a real company to work for. What year? Who, what? What year? The year. What year did you go to TVA? I don't know. I worked there 52 years. I don't know what year it was. 52? No. Yeah. Uh, I did. I just worked at Combustion about a year, oh. and uh, I heard they had a program. Did you go to Hell's Bar? For, like first, that? first place that TVA ever sent me to was Hell's Bar. Not to built nineteen twenty three. It was okay. I thought it was a new one, and he was one of the original. Tennessee River Electric Power Company. If you want to see it. When you go the freeway, you get to 20th Street, it's still on the building there, on a concrete building at the top, Tennessee River Electric Power Company. It's still on that building. My, I was born in 51, and they, they were living. What, where were you working when, when you lived in Spring City? I worked at TVA at, Hell, at Watts Bar. It was Watts Bar before or after Hell's Bar? That's after Hell's Bar. I worked for a year at Hell's Bar. Okay, so he would have worked at Hell's Bar in the late in the late forties, because. No, it was in nineteen fifty. Okay. I went to work at Hell's Bar in nineteen fifty so sometime. Work, got married <clears throat> and then had me the next year. I, I rode my Harley down there to work. You had a Harley? That's when I got home from service, I went down to the dealer on Main Street and told him I want to buy the biggest and best Harley Davidson they make. And I said, I, I want a ridden. Well, he had a buddy over, uh, what was his name? Uh, Joe's daddy? What was, what, what was the Harley Davidson? Paid, O.L. Paid. <clears throat> He had a buddy that wanted one, so he got mine, and I got a blue one, but it was all right. It's a pretty thing. But uh, I wouldn't ride one on the freeway today for $100 a mile. I tell you, it's dangerous. It was a 57 panhead. Well, I'm sorry. 47. 47. 
Forty-seven panhead. No, it's a forty-nine. 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 Anyway, <laughs> I love that hummer. I had a little buddy. <clears throat> Luke Hilson had five daughters, and I was sitting on his front porch one time, and I heard a Harley coming, you know, up that back valley road over the hill, and they'll chick a chick a little right along, you know, come right along Luke's front driveway and he rolled up in the yard and got out. Old tall lanky boy. Old Arby. David Arwood. <laughs> He's the best friend I ever had. Me and him went to Florida just to be a doing. You know, we'd ride a motorcycle down there. I, I, Heard a bike week. Yeah, we went to bike week and every other week. <laughs> 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 I get off on Friday at six o'clock. He'd come by and we'd have a case of Cokes and in the sidecar, he had a sidecar. And uh, we've been in sidecars and we've been solos. I don't know how many times we went. I mean, we went just to be doing, you know, for the thrill of riding. He was a real joy. He had five girls and uh, he kept, he said, uh, uh, he always wanted a son, you know. He told me, I want a son, you know. Had five girls. He told me one day, he said, I don't want to try again or not. I said, I'll, you, you might hit it. Try it. <laughs> well, he had a boy. And the boy was, he was about 12 years old. He got his eye put out with a stick, I think. And his, uh, but he, he, he died long time ago. He would but remind I, you of a dark-headed fast parker, if you remember. I, I, I love that boy. He he didn't call nothing, you know. He just blessed his heart. But he liked to ride. We took that 60, he had a 61 cubic inch. I took the cylinders out. I got a, of course I went to tech school, you know, machinist. I bought me a lathe when I got home from school, you know. South Bend Lay, so I took, uh, made a boring bar, took up his cylinders and bored them out a 16, trying to make a 74 out of it, you know. It's a 61 cubic inch. And uh, we, we uh, had to change the length of the, I, I cut the heads down too and I had to change the length of the push rod. So I cut them on, put them back together. Made him, made him a seventy-four out of a sixty-one, you know. But it run many, it run many years. Bless his heart. You didn't mention the, you did not mention being in California, the base you told me and Steve to go to when we were out there, or was it Washington? Washington or California? The big base out there. Well, San Diego was a, a marine base, but I don't know. Was there one in Washington State? No. Fort Lewis. I, Lewis. I don't remember. Fort Lewis? I remember telling you that to check with that, but I don't know. Too, too far gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Um take a break here.